Hey, welcome back to the Adult Bible Study with First Baptist Church of Ray City. My name is Charles. I'm one of our associate pastors, and today we're going to be diving back into the book of Job, chapter 40, verse 1 through 14. I hope you enjoy today's Bible study. Job 40, verse 1 and 2 is at the very end of the Lord's first speech to Job. and He's asking Job, will the one who contends, that is, will Job, because Job is the one who's contesting the Lord, will he correct him? What is the Lord asking Job with this question? Well, he's asking Job to, as it says, correct him. Since he finds fault with the way that God is running the world. I like how the ESV puts it because I think it's a little bit clearer in the way that it words it, at least to me. And it says, shall a fault finder contend with the Almighty? Because that's exactly what Job is doing. He is trying to correct the Lord because he finds fault in the way that the Lord has constructed reality. And he's attacking or contesting as in a lawsuit with the Lord, which is exactly what Elihu has accused Job of back in Job 33, 13, when he says, why do you take him to court? That him is the Lord. Why do you take him to court for not answering anything a person asks? Elihu is accusing Job of taking the Lord to court. And that's what the Lord is saying that Job is doing in a court official kind of manner. Are you trying to contend with the Lord? Are you trying to correct him because you find fault in the way that he is working? Let him who argues with God give an answer. God is calling Job to prove something. But what is God calling Job to prove? Well, God has spent the last two chapters proving his case as orchestrator and controller of the universe. And now he is asking Job to testify to the faults that he has found in the world. This is a really good opportunity for us to remember exactly where Job is at in this moment. We have spent 39 chapters up to this point, of which the bulk of those was Job arguing back and forth with his three friends. And then the last few was Elihu arguing with Job. And then God responds those there in these last two chapters. And all of it points to mainly one thing, and that is that Job has had horrible, if we remember back to chapter 1 and chapter 2, repercussions in his life. He has lost all of his wealth. He has lost all of his possessions. He has lost all of his family. He has lost his wife who has left him and said that he should curse God and die. He has lost his health. Everything has been taken away from Job. So if there was somebody who was going to find fault in the way that the world is working, it would appear that Job would be that person. So God is asking Job to argue his case to give a response. So how will Job respond to this challenge that the Lord has given him? Just as Job has done this entire book, even if he does find fault with God, he recognizes God's worthiness over his own. Because Job answered the Lord and said, I am so insignificant. Why does Job respond in this way? Well, Job realizes and agrees with God, who's been arguing for the last two chapters about his worthiness. He agrees with God's assessment of his smallness and his unworthiness in comparison to the Lord. How can I answer you, being the one who is worthy? How can the one who is not worthy, Job, answer the one who is worthy? And so he places his hand over his mouth. He knows that he has spoken once, even twice, given his case. And now he says, I have nothing to add. But there's something that's missing in this response. Because Job does not really say anything about God, but says something about himself. Only says about himself that he is insignificant. And that he needs to shut his mouth. But there isn't an expression of his own defeat. 
Job is in essence asking the Lord to continue his speech, but he is not yet repentant of his sinful attitude and of trying to find fault with God. And then the Lord responds back to Job's response and continues. Then the Lord answered Job from the whirlwind, get ready to answer me like a man. This is a restating of the way he introed his first speech in 38, 1 and 3, where it says, and then the Lord answered Job from the whirlwind. And then verse 3, get ready to answer me like a man. The only difference is in 38, 1 through 3, God gives his accusation of Job at this point, which is that Job is the one who has obscured counsel with ignorant words. Basically, Job is speaking without knowing anything. Well, now that he has given his first speech and Job knows something, now God has a true accusation against him. Would you challenge, would you really challenge my justice? Would you declare me guilty to justify yourself? Those are the the accusations that God is bringing against Job. Because God realizes that Job is seeking to put God on trial, to condemn God, to justify himself. Whether that's exactly what Job has meant to do, his actions of trying to find fault with God, and of being that fault finder, the person who is trying to correct the Almighty, that's exactly what he was doing. Do you have an arm like God's? Can you thunder with a voice like His? God is asking Job if he can take his place. And this is made abundantly clear in the next section. But before we dive into that, we need to look at what it means to have an arm like God's and to thunder with a voice like God's. Well, to have an arm like God's is a symbol of God's power to rescue and bring judgment This is seen in multiple places throughout Scripture, but to just give a few, Exodus 6.6 says, Therefore tell the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from the forced labor of the Egyptians and rescue you from slavery. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and great acts of judgment. It is God's arm, His outstretched arm, that brings back the people of Israel. In Deuteronomy 26, 8, the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a strong hand and an outstretched arm. It is the Lord, again, who brings his people out of Egypt with terrifying power, with signs and wonders. Notice also that in this outstretched arm, there is both the redemption of the people of Israel and the acts of great judgment and the terrifying power that brings signs and wonders. And we can think back on the plagues of Egypt and know that that's exactly what signs and wonders point to. Isaiah 51.9 gives us an understanding of the arm of the Lord because it says, wake up, wake up, arm of the Lord. That is that righteous, redeeming power that also crushes the wicked. Clothe yourself with strength. Wasn't it you who hacked Rahab to pieces and who pierced the sea dragon? Literally, wasn't it you who destroyed our enemies, the wicked, and brought us out? And then finally, Isaiah 52, 10, the Lord has displayed his holy arm in the sight of all the nations. All the ends of the earth will see the salvation of God. It is his holy arm that brings the salvation to the people of Israel. All of this amounts to God's arm is a symbol of His power to rescue and to bring judgment. But then what does it mean to thunder with the voice like God? Well, Elihu tells us a little bit of that from Job chapter 37 verses 1 through 5. My heart pounds at this and leaps within my chest. Just listen to his thunderous voice and the rumbling that comes from his mouth. 
He lets it loose beneath the entire sky, his lightning to the ends of the earth, and then there comes a roaring sound. God thunders with a majestic voice. He does not restrain the lightning, and when his rumbling voice is heard, God thunders wondrously with his voice, and he does great things that we cannot comprehend. God's voice is a thunderous thing that is not able to be comprehended. And it does things that we cannot comprehend, like tell the lightning where to strike and cause the storm clouds to roll and roar. So again, what God is asking Job is if he can take his place. Now let's see how God makes that more clear in this next section. Adorn yourself with majesty and splendor. Clothe yourself with honor and glory. How does God tell Job to take his place first? By dressing the part. By adorning himself with the majesty of God and the splendor of God. By clothing himself with the honor and glory of God. God is telling Job, let's see how well you do adorning yourself with my splendor and my majesty. This continues to show Job his disqualification to be the kind of person who can correct God. His disqualification as being the the person who is unintentionally trying to usurp the throne of God with his contention and accusations of God's mishandling of the wicked and the righteous. And then God gives Job his assignment. Pour out your anger. Look on every proud person and humiliate him. Look on every proud person and humble him. Trample the wicked where they stand. Hide them together in the dust and imprison them in the grave. God is telling Job to show how his wrath would pour out on those who do evil and crush them. This is ironic since Job had accused God of neglecting to punish the wicked. And an example of that is Job 24, 1 through 7 and verse 12, where Job says, Why does the Almighty not reserve a time of judgment? Literally, is God not going to judge the wicked? Why do those who know Him never see this day? How come the people who know God, who are righteous, who are living for God, how come they never see the judgment that comes against the wicked? Those wicked who displace boundary markers, who steal property from people, who steal flock and provide pasture for it. They drive away the donkey owned by the fatherless and take the widow's ox. They take from those who are weak. They push the needy off the road and the poor of the land are forced into hiding. Like wild donkeys in the wilderness, the poor go out to their task of foraging for food. They have taken everything. These wicked people have displaced boundary markers, have stolen from the powerless, have forced them into hiding and foraging for food. The desert provides nourishment for their children. That is the poor. Not even their children are being cared for well because they can't care for themselves because the wicked have placed a burden on the powerless and the needy. And they lie without cover in the cold of the night. Continues on from there, but we'll jump all the way down to verse 12 where it says, Yet God pays no attention to the crimes of the wicked, to this crime. Job is accusing God of neglecting to punish the wicked. And so God is asking Job, how would you do it? Pour out your rage. Look at all these proud people, all these people who need to be humiliated. How would you do it? Humble them, Job. Humble the proud and trample them and then hide them in the dust, in their grave, imprisoning them there forever. How would you do all of this, Job? God seemingly hands over the reins and shows Job he is fully powerless to fulfill this task. And what would be the outcome if Job could complete this task? Well, God would then... Confess to Job, your own right hand can deliver you. That Job, as himself, could deliver himself. 
the purpose of all of this. What is God accomplishing trying to challenge Job in this way? Job has consistently pointed to God as the higher, greater being, as the one who is higher than he is. Yet Job has fallen prey of complaining and pointing out the faults that he sees in the way that the world is and the fact that the wicked still live. What God was showing Job is the difficulty in the task. Not that it is too difficult for God, but it is too difficult for Job. Judging the world is a task that only can be accomplished by God and God alone. That is exactly what is being pointed out here. What God is trying to show Job and what he shows Job in this next chapter, talking about the behemoth and Leviathan who cannot be controlled by men and yet God tells them exactly what to do and leads them around in the same way where Job is completely powerless to do anything. God is powerful to do everything and is trying to show Job that what Job is asking for is a God-sized problem that can only be accomplished by God himself. Welcome to the question and answer time. My name is Summer, I'm Pastor Charles' wife. We're glad you're here with us. We're glad you're at the end of the book of Job with us. Which honestly, as we're ending this book and nearing the end, I just want to read the whole thing, mm -hmm. you know, in depth in a study. I just, I could like marinate in this book for a while. I just really love it so much. And these last two chapters are some of my favorite in the whole entire Bible. I just love how God shows up at the end of the book of Job. Mm -hmm. um, something that I just was drawn back to as I was listening to the study is just like how dare me, you know, like Job... He is righteous before God, and he still gets to the point where he's questioning and, like, pointing his finger at God. And how quickly do I get to that spot way before, you know, I lose my health and my whole family and all my everything, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think Job really should, like, put a spotlight on our own hearts that this is a human problem um, to blame God when things get hard and in our suffering. And so I just wanted you to maybe just take a minute to talk about repentance in the Christian life and how do those go hand in hand together? Well, I would say repentance is one, I mean, one of the cornerstones of the Christian life. Um, because repentance means that you are turning, you're asking for, for forgiveness and turning from your sins. And if you're not doing that, then you're not truly laying it down on a foot cross. Mm -hmm. um, and, but you're continuing on in your life labeling a Christian without actually living out the Christian life. Because ultimately, our lives are to be lives of re regular repentance. And, and that's ultimately what we see happen with Job. So Job, in the study that we were in today, he did not repent. Mm -hmm. But he ultimately sees through... Uh, through these next two chapters as God's doing his second speech, that he is trying to do and was trying to do a God-sized job that he had no, no right, no capability, and no job trying to do that job. Mm -hmm. He ultimately fell short in that. That's why Job, at the end, I would argue, repents. In Job 42, verse 6, which we're going to get next week, but I'm going to go ahead and jump a little bit ahead. It said, I heard of you by the hearing of the ear. This is verse 5, actually. But now my eyes see you. So now he hasn't just heard of God, but he physically has seen God before him, speaking to him through the whirlwind. And he knows God, not just hearing about the magnificence of God, but he truly sees the magnificence of God. And what does it ultimately do? Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ash. He realizes his sin and he turns, he throws dust and ash on himself, which are symbols of sorrow and remorse because he realizes his sin. And he repents of it and he turns. It's the same thing that you see in Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 6, when he sees the throne of God, and he says, woe am I. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the Lord sends the seraphim with the coal in his hand to touch Isaiah's mouth. 
to cleanse him so that he might go and speak to his people. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, again, what we see when we truly see God for who he is, is we see ourselves as woeful sinners in need of the mercy and grace of God. And so that's what we want to challenge you with today, is to take what you see in Job and use it as a magnifying glass for your own heart. Mm -hmm. And allow it to do a work so that you might repent of your sins. Mm -hmm. So that you might turn from your wicked way, as the Bible would say. And allow the work and the mercy of God to work in your heart. Mm -hmm. So we're, uh, we're hoping for you this. We're praying for you. And we look forward uh, to continuing to dive in to the book of Job next week.